Hello and welcome to today's webinar, which is part of the Accountability Frameworks Company Training Webinar Series. Today's topic is respecting workers' rights in commodity supply chains. Please note that our webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent to participants in a few days. The audio and video functions have been disabled as well as the chat function, but we do welcome your questions. Please type any questions into the Q&A. Some will be answered in writing as we go along and others will be answered by panelists during the Q&A portion of our webinar towards the end. With those housekeeping details out of the way, let's get started. My name is Rachel Rigby, Human Rights Lead at Rainforest Alliance. I will serve as moderator of today's session. Rainforest Alliance is a member of the Accountability Framework Initiative Coalition, and I'm a member of the AFI's Workers' Rights Working Group. I will kick off today's program with an overview of the Accountability Framework Initiative, and then delve a bit more into the contents of the framework itself, including a focus on the human rights and labor rights content of the framework. I'm very pleased also to welcome today's three guest speakers. Our first guest speaker will be Dawn Robinson, Director, Social Responsibility and Human Rights at ProForest. Dawn is also a member of the AFI Coalition and the Workers' Rights Working Group. She will begin our session with some remarks about how companies can operationalize the kinds of good practice that are described in the accountability frameworks, principles, and tools. She will focus specifically on using human rights due diligence within responsible sourcing programs. Secondly, we welcome Madeline Eilert, Global Sustainable Sourcing Leader, Sugar and Coconut at Nestle. After Dawn's points, we will turn to Madeline for a company perspective on human rights due diligence in the sugar supply chain, the challenges, how they tackle issues, and key learnings. And third, we are pleased to be joined by Art Prapa of Oxfam. He's the Senior Advisor Campaigns and Advocacy at Oxfam. Art will follow from Madeline's presentation with a discussion of the evidence that Oxfam has gathered on salient human rights issues in commodity supply chains, as well as what civil society groups expect of companies working in these sectors. And we also have with us Karen Steer, who is a member of the AFI Backbone Team, which is how the Secretariat of the AFI is known, and she will be monitoring the Q&A in the chat. So thank you very much, Karen. So let's jump into a brief overview of the Accountability Framework Initiative, starting with why it exists. The AFI came about from a growing realization that many companies either weren't making commitments around certain key sustainability issues, most notably deforestation, or for those that were making commitments, the commitments lacked accountability or implementation measures. So the AFI's goal is to make responsible supply chains the new normal by addressing three key gaps. First, companies need to make stronger and wider reaching commitments. This means commitments that extend to all of their material risks. They need to use commonly agreed upon definitions in making those commitments and set targets and milestones that are aligned and comparable across companies. The second gap to ethical supply chains is effective implementation. We had noted that even companies that had effective commitments often lacked effective ways to put them into practice. There was a need for alignment and guidance on how to take action. And the third key gap is having robust accountability systems, making sure that companies are communicating and reporting on the commitments they have made using standardized metrics. So the AFI seeks to fill all of these gaps. Moving on from the why, let's quickly talk about what. What is the Accountability Framework Initiative? The initiative consists of two parts, the AFI coalition and the product, the, the framework, a common framework for setting, implementing, and demonstrating progress on commitments. Next slide. The AFI coalition is diverse, made up of civil society organizations with expertise in all areas of the framework, environmental and social. It includes organizations that work at the global level, as well as those that work in production landscapes. And the product is the accountability framework, which is which was approved by consensus by the AFI steering group in June 2019. It consists of a set of 12 core principles, definitions and guidance 
for setting, implementing, and reporting on ethical supply chain commitments. I'll talk more about the core principles soon, but first I wanted to show you more broadly the scope of what it covers. In terms of commodities, the framework is very broad. It's meant to be a global reference that can be used for any commodity sourcing in areas of high deforestation. Its geographic scope is global, but the focus has been where risks to deforestation and ecosystem conversion are higher. The topical scope of the framework is quite specific. It focuses on deforestation, conversion of natural ecosystems, and human rights. The framework is constructed around what we call core principles, and core principle two is on respect for human rights. So companies commit to respecting human rights equally for all persons, regardless of gender and without discrimination. And as you can see from the slide, the framework is aligned with international norms, including the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and the OECD guidelines. Within core principle two is principle 2.3 on respect for workers' rights. Here too, the framework is aligned with the relevant international norms, the international labor organization conventions. And in some cases, the framework goes beyond, for example, on living wage. This slide shows how core principle two on respect for human rights fits within the broader range of core principles. And many of those are also relevant to human rights, such as core principle five on supply chain assessment and traceability, which is necessary for human rights due diligence, and core principle nine on access to remedy. Complementing the core principles are operational guidances. Most core principles are accompanied by an operational guidance that goes into further detail about how to implement that principle. The operational guidance on workers' rights is the most recent one, and it was released a few months ago. It focuses on employer obligations to respect the rights of workers and implementation, how to put those rights into practice. A key focus is on management systems and the due diligence process. This operational guidance was developed by a working group of AFI coalition members, including Rainforest Alliance, the labor rights organizations Verite and Social Accountability International, and ProForest, which, and Don was actually a member of the group. Don is our next speaker, and I will now hand over the microphone to her. Again, welcome, Don. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks, AFI, for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, uh, I'm going to start by just telling you who, who ProForest is for those that are perhaps not familiar. So we're a mission-driven organization, um, a not-for-profit group um, that works throughout agricultural and forest supply chains to contribute to sustainable livelihoods in sustainable landscapes. And we support production and sourcing in such a way as to deliver positive outcomes for people and the environment. We do that via three principal mechanisms. We support companies directly to deliver on their sustainability commitments, um, understanding and taking action. We support collaborative initiatives, whether that's a global uh, or sector specific or a site, uh, a place-based initiative, like a landscape initiative. Um, and throughout, we provide knowledge and capacity um, via developing and adapting tools and training and um, providing capacity building. We work in a global context. We have offices in eight countries. And importantly, we work very much in partnership with local and global experts on, particular, uh, on specific topics. So as has been said, I'm gonna talk particularly about the value that we see in using a human rights due diligence approach to respect workers' rights in agricultural commodity supply chains um, and indeed to respect all human rights. And we value this not because of the, the driver that is a lot of conversations around legislation requesting or expecting companies to report on human rights due diligence, but because it genuinely is a really robust framework that is practical 
um, and fits very well with companies' management systems. So what's on screen is responsible business conduct as defined by the, the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. Um, and what it shows is, um, is that human rights due diligence is at the core of that, but it's very much needs to be supported on either side by effective policy commitments and processes to enable remediation of um, negative impacts um, to the people that are affected. So it's valuable because it's an ongoing management process. Exactly what you do as a company will depend on the context in which you work, where you are in the supply chain, the size of your business. Um, but it, it makes sense in, indeed for working across both environmental and human rights aspects of response, responsible sourcing and production, something that both AFI and ProForest have in common. Um, and so it needs to start with identification of where the issues are um, and it recognizing that to do this, you need to have traceability in order to understand why you're buying from. So you can see a reference there to traceability being an enabling element for good practice. So that kind of principle of needing to understand where you're buying from is the same whether you are a sugarcane mill buying from a network of 3,000 smallholder cane growers or a manufacturing brand buying indirectly from 1,200 palm oil mills globally. Uh, the more you know about where you buy from, the more ability you have to understand the risks and to take action to address them. Um, and uh, AFI has guidance that relates to several of these steps within the core principles that were, that were referenced, such as um, information on what it means to have a robust policy commitment in core principle two, and several of the aspects of human rights due diligence, um, such as uh, addressing and embedding is covered across kind of um, three or four of the core principles, six, six to nine really. Um, so it's, but it's important that the risk assessment informs as much as possible about the nature of the human rights issues and abuses that may be happening um, and the production aspects that they're associated with and the types of people affected um, based on that, you can then build more effective mechanisms to address them. And in fact, most of my talks are going to focus on what it means to address um, those issues. So a couple of, uh, well, three, in fact, key elements to have in mind when implementing human rights due diligence. And that is that this is about putting risk to people. So if you're interested particularly in workers' rights, risk to workers at the heart of decision-making, that's often very similar to materiality, but not always exactly the same. Um, meaningful stakeholder engagement throughout, not just at risk assessment, where we tend to think of it as being particularly um, valuable, but in helping to design the strategies that need uh, action to take place and also in helping to monitor and track whether those are effective. And finally, embedding action in a company's processes and across departments, not treating this as some sort of separate work stream that belongs only to people with a human rights title in their, in their job description, um, but embedding it in everything that's already being done. So uh, the heart of what I want to mention is the importance of developing an action plan. Um, we talked about how it must respond to the, to the risk found it, but it's based on risk to people. Actions, timelines, and KPIs are important in order to embed and align people um, around that action plan. And importantly, remediation needs to be part of that. I think we often see sustainability leads, in, particularly in downstream and midstream companies, uh, a little overwhelmed in the face of risk assessment information about how many different issues are raised and how widespread they are. It can feel complicated. So the value we see on developing an action plan is that you spell out for your internal team and external audiences where you are um, starting your, your journey. There's an understanding and it's written in the UNGPs that you can't do everything all at the same time, but you need to be clear about why you're starting um, where you are and how you will gradually um, make a difference over time. And being clear about how you'll be using commercial leverage and broader business leverage 
and joint leverage with others should be part of that. And importantly, thinking about already how you're going to measure the impact of the actions that you're taking on the affected people, even if you're quite a long way downstream. So one way that we in pro for us, this is actually part of our theory of change, is the, is the importance of working within and beyond the supply chain. And it's a really good way of framing an action plan to address human rights issues, to address workers' rights issues, for example, specifically. So within the supply chain, really talking about the leverage you have with the suppliers you buy from and their supply chains, um, so tier, tier one suppliers and further up, upstream and along that chain and what you're specifying that you want out of the volumes that you buy, but also your behavior as a company in terms of the way that you procure things, the prices you pay, the conditions you put on things. And we'll, there's a couple of slides on both of these coming up. And beyond the supply chain, meaning um, using your leverage to address systemic issues with peers, with multi-stakeholder spaces, with other actors who really need to be part of um, delivering the change to make it um, effective. So that's typically both a mixture of direct investment upstream, so a place-based engagement, or collaboration within particular initiatives, um, bodies that are, that are trying to address complex systemic issues, whether that's um, you know, payment of recruitment fees or whether it's a sectoral space, say a palm oil round table. So uh, a little short on time, so I'll come through these quite quickly and we can come back to them if we have time. So taking action within the supply chain, we, we work with companies on, um, on things like how to use supplier engagement um, to effectively embed human rights aspects into what you're asking. So supplier selection, do you have criteria around their human rights record? Contracting and assessment, do you have strong enough commitments and requirements in codes of conduct? Do you have mechanisms that you're using to support them if their grievance and management systems are not um, effective enough? And there's lots of questions there that we could come back to about the questions that you need to ask and, and you'll get a copy of this um, to think about when you're choosing those actions. How will you measure progress, for example? Um, next slide. And beyond the supply chain, as I mentioned, those are two areas. So for in-country projects and initiatives, um, you need to pick uh, your, high, your sites that are most at risk for your salient human rights risks and understand who are the people that are at risk, what are the issues there, and how can you be engaging with people in those places uh, to make a difference to the, the complex, often complex systemic issues that are in place there. Um, I think I'll jump onto the, the last slide, which are my takeaway messages, which are just a, a reminder that embedding actions into existing systems, whether that's the internal audit system, the procurement team, the human resources team is the most effective way to really uh, deliver those changes, taking action Within, within and beyond the supply chain, prioritizing risk to people, engaging suppliers throughout. And finally, I think this, the value of collaboration cannot be overestimated. Uh, everyone recognizing recognizes that this is proven difficult for one supply chain and one upstream actor to address. So collaborate, collaborate, um, and work with experts um, it, on both in your supply chain work, but also upstream in addressing these, these issues. And, and finally, the resources that uh, Rachel already mentioned, that the Workers' Rights Operational Guidance has a really nice section three on human rights due diligence and management systems. And um, the Palmer Collaboration Group recently launched a, an HRDD library of tools, uh, which is a great starting point for anyone who wants to embark on a, an HRDD journey with a particular focus on agricultural commodities. So thanks, Rachel, and sorry that I think I've overrun by one minute. Thank you very much, Dawn. And uh, just to add uh, an extra endorsement to that library of tools, I've found it very useful myself. Um, so um, we see that some hands have been raised, and I just want to remind all participants, we welcome your questions. Please type them into the Q&A function. And if you specifically prefer to ask your question verbally, please state that in the Q&A function, and then 
when we get to the Q&A portion of our meeting, uh, we can unmute you to have you ask a question. Thank you very much. Okay, next we will turn to Madeline for a company perspective on human rights due diligence in the sugar supply chain. Thank you very much, Rachel. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share our work on human rights and to give you a very short glimpse on our work in uh, our sugar cane sourcing. Uh, next. So as you can see, the sugar industry is very fragmented, which causes a lot of challenges, especially when it comes to traceability, which is the first step if you want to better understand your supply chains and the potential social and environmental risks. This is, uh, I mean, this applies to every agricultural commodity and isn't specific to sugar, but it causes a lot of challenges in sugar, especially given the huge number of countries you see it's produced in 110 countries, which is a lot of work in tracing materials back. Next. So a very short glimpse on our um, Nestle human rights journey. So our journey started back in 2008 when we signed a collaboration with the Danish Institute for Human Rights, um, which uh, helped us to conduct several human rights impact assessments, mainly in our cocoa, coffee, palm, and dairy supply chains. Uh, in 2012, we were the first food and beverage company to join the FLA, which a big focus on, again, cocoa, coffee, and later on uh, our hazelnut sourcing. And I would say our last major update was really our work uh, on our human rights was the launch of our new human rights committee. Um, next slide, please. In, uh, in 2020, um, and the committee developed our current human rights framework and roadmap. Uh, next. So our human rights due diligence system is, um, have been updated very recently and is um, based on our Nestle business principles and aligned with international standards. Next. The refreshed governance model is key for an actual fulfillment of the company policies and is also recognized in the AFI framework's core principle for on management systems. So having a strong governance is really key to to implement, to have full support in the supplier engagement and farmers throughout the supply chain. Next, please. Coming to, to sugar, which is really, I mean, I'm really glad to share this because um, I think it doesn't really get the necessary attention. There are always articles about sugar, but I think since there isn't really one specific area or main sourcing country or let's say like in the Palmer case or orangutan, it probably didn't get the attraction yet. We see more and more and um, it gets more attention, which is good because I think there's sort of, and there are a lot of challenges and those need to be addressed. Next, please. So our journey on, on our work on sugar began back in 2011 when we collaborated with, uh, with ProForest, who is our global implementation partner on sugar. They support us in mapping and assessing our supply chains, starting with desk-based risk assessments based on supplier locations, especially sugar mill and supply base. And then we prioritize which mills and supply bases will get an on-site visit to better understand potential risks and collaboration opportunities. Following the assessments, we really work and support the supplier to develop action plans. They, um, depending on the identified issues, we might engage in a longer term collaboration, which can be really, which can really last several years. And we use different tools to assess, which is um, we have our an assessment checklist, which is also based on international standards. We use the FSA checklist to guide some of the questions. And we also look for the AFI framework for guidance to make sure that what we do and assess is aligned with, um, with the framework. Next, please. This is a, just a really short example of how we are um, tackling issues 
in our sugar supply chain with an example for in our work in Mexico. So, um, issues that we have been addressing since 2014 through collaboration with our two main suppliers, Beta San Miguel and La Gloria, is um, child labor, living conditions, and um, working conditions for cane cutters. So um, some of the actions was really uh, to develop a human rights policy to implement it, to establish age checks, ID cards for, for workers, and to raise more awareness among farmers and communities about child labor and find, uh, try to find alternatives like setting up local schools. Living in working conditions is um, it's a really big challenge in the sugarcane sector. For, um, because there are a lot of migrant workers, and one of the key activities was to, to upgrade shelters so that they have um, proper living conditions, installing sufficient and appropriate sanitation, with showers and toilets, training on how to, to maintain the shelters, and uh, we developed a protocol to guide the refurbishment of, uh, of shelters for migrant workers. And then, yeah, working conditions, it's about provision of clean drinking water uh, during the harvest season, ensuring that they have access to, um, to water and hygiene services, appropriate um, personal protective equipment, first aid kits, and so on and so forth. So, and those is really done by Proforest, who's really a key driver of the work together with the suppliers because I mean, we, we can't do it alone. And we also have beyond supply chains, industry co collaborations where we work with peer companies, industry, and um, to try to develop a, a wider national program to address those challenges. And next please. And yeah, a key, a key learning is really that addressing human rights is a journey and as Dawn said earlier, you have to start somewhere. We can't tackle everything at the same time, but the most important is to get started. Collaboration is key. No one can do it alone. It requires a lot of commitment from, from everyone in the supply chain. And this is really all sectors needs to be part of the journey. And this includes investors, banks, NGOs, farmers, associations, and um, yeah, workers. So really from A to Z, everyone needs to be part of the journey because only together we will solve and address the issues. Thank you very much, Madeline. Um, now we'll, we, we will turn to Art um, to discuss the evidence that Oxfam has gathered on salient human rights issues in commodities supply chains, as well as what civil society groups expect of companies working in these sectors. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, very pleased to be here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to 103 people on the, on the webinar today. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to be talking about respecting and integrating worker rights into commodity supply chains. And, you know, I'm hoping to bring some perspective, as Rachel said, from the civil society uh, organizations. So I work for Oxfam America as Senior Advisor for Campaign and Advocacy, and um, I'm currently co-leading our global supermarket campaigns uh, behind the barcodes. Uh, uh, so I've been engaging with uh, national and international food companies and retailers on the topics of worker rights, uh, inequality, and, and gender justice in global supply chains. Uh, next, please. Uh, in my quick presentation today, and I'm hoping to get into more of a, of a discussion, I'll cover three things. Uh, the first is why worker rights matter and, and why now, given the, the day and age that we are currently living through uh, in still in the midst of COVID-19 for many of the developing countries and producing countries. Uh, I wanted to bring that uh, campaigning and, and advocacy organization perspective, because I think you know we need really a constructive and honest conversation about the topic, about what's next and, and what do we need to do in, in order to address it. And second, Secondly, I would like to bring some of the latest evidence, um, scorecard assessments, salient, analysis, salient issue analysis and cases uh, from Oxfam uh, on the ground and from partners in different countries uh, uh, to share with you. And thirdly, what can be done? Uh, again, on the expectation and policy ask from, from Oxfam and, and other civil society who have been uh, working alongside with Oxfam uh, on, on these important issues. But first of all, I wanted to start with the framing. 
uh, the framing of the root causes of labor exploitation in our global food supply chains. Uh, and as you can see here, there, there's a circle on the screen. On the one hand, you have the increasing power right, of food companies and supermarkets uh, you know, by means of market concentrations, by the ability to really set the terms of trade and, and the purchasing practices throughout the supply chains. And that's almost create the demand uh, for labor exploitation in, in global supply chains. But on the other hand, you also have the declining power of small scale farmers and workers as a result of direct public policy in many of the producing countries over the last 40 years uh, that take away their rights to freely associate, to collectively bargain, and to be able to neg negotiate for better pay and work better working conditions. And in turn, it creates the supply of vulnerable labor uh, into, into the supply chain that are more subjected to, to exploitation. And I'll come later in a bit to say women are, you know, uh, the one that have been hit the hardest because they are often being entrenched by gender norms in, in many of the contexts uh, that, that we will talk about today. There's inequality of power on the one hand, and then there is inequality of value uh, across some of the commodities in our global supply chains on the other. And as you can see on the graph here, we work on the latest research with our research partner, Le Basic, uh, to look at the percentage of values accrued to workers and farmers across a number of commodities uh, as a percentage of end consumer price. Uh, so whatever consumer price is paying, these are the percentage that actually goes to workers and farmers. For wine, tea, and shrimp, you can see that the percentage are extremely low. For wine, it's below 1.5% in terms of the share of workers. Uh, for tea, it's between 0.7 to 3%. For shrimp, it's about below 0.75% across the board. And for rice and coffee, you can see a really high um, trends of fluctuation in terms of the end consumer price share uh, for farmers and workers working in those industry. And I think this still continues to be problematic in terms of the un un you know, un un unfair share of value across, across a number of commodities that in turn uh, uh, led to, to more labor exploitation in the global supply chain. So why now? Um, as I mentioned before, you know, many of the developing and producing countries are still very much uh, uh, are struggling. And I mean, including the US and the UK, new variances are, are emerging again, but market disruption is real and it's already here over the past 22 months. You know, we, you know I don't have to repeat some of these headlines to you, but a couple of trends that are, are really significant, right? The first is there have been some momentum around the movement um, along the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation and that's already happening in Europe. Um, in the US, there have been some strong discussion about how do we empower the effectiveness of US legislative tools uh, to ban goods that are linked to forced labor uh, and labor rights violation into the US markets. Uh, there have been more calls from consumers uh, and investors uh, for more transparency and, and supply chain transparency uh, for companies to be more accountable. There have been supply chain disruptions you know, the focus and the reliance is on optimization and efficiency without consideration to the people factors and people aspects in the global supply chains have continued to cause some of these disruptions as, as companies sort of play a whack-a-mole uh, strategy in terms of addressing supply chain disruption at one point and then trying to also mitigate a disruption that, you know, at, at other points in, in the supply chain. And finally, uh, you know, we are about 22 months into the pandemic. There have been some strong evidence about the uneven impact of the pandemic on the workers, particularly supply chain workers and farmers who are living and working and producing our food in the global south, as opposed to shareholders uh, and, 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 and senior executive of companies in, in the global north. So those are some of the real evidence at the market disruption, the changing stakeholders' as, as expectation uh, on companies uh, on, on these issues. I wanted to bring it home to what Oxfam have been doing in terms of trying to present evidence-based analysis and evidence. And this is one of the one of the scorecards that we've published in the in the last couple of years as part of our Behind the Barcodes campaign. So this is our 2020 uh, scorecard that look at four different categories of policy and practice that company towards supply chain transparency in the first column, worker rights in the second column. Uh, small scale farmers and women rights in the fourth column. So we assess uh, 16 leading supermarkets across four different countries in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the US and in the UK. And as you can see, even the top scorer of the supermarket scorecard assessment, Tesco in the UK have earned only 46%. I mean, that is by far 
you know, the highest scorer in, in our table. And then as, as we move towards sort of at the bottom of the tables, where the majority of the people who are occupying those places are actually American retailers uh, in the single digit number. So there are some significant rooms for improvement uh, for many of the practices, particularly to do with worker rights, uh, uh, gender equality and supply chain transparency in, in the global retail sector. And as you see uh, more specifically in the women's column, uh, six companies have actually earned zero score uh, on those policies. And I think it's important to actually understand where are the women uh, in our global supply chains and how we, you know, having putting, putting in place a policy that allow those women to also prosper, get out of poverty and, and have their rights be, be respected. Um, next, please. Another piece of evidence that I wanted to share with this, uh, with this group here is, is the evidence around living wages and, and the operational guidance and, and the core principles have, have you know, guidance and examples you know, around how do we improve the issues of living wages for, for workers uh, and also living income for, for small scale farmers in, in your supply chain. But you know, we conducted surveys across four countries, uh, Brazil coffee workers, uh, tea workers in Assam, India, South Africa uh, for the wine agriculture workers and in Thailand trim workers. For Brazil, the, the living wage gap um, is around 40%. So that means workers only earn about 60% of living wage uh, in Brazil who are actually producing uh, uh, coffee for us. The gap between living wage benchmark uh, for TSM as you know, when compared to the minimum wage is 81%. Uh, in South Africa, it's 18%. And interestingly, in Thailand, 58% of the survey workers have told us that they're not even earning a, minim a monthly minimum wage, uh, which is commonly lower than a living wage. And you know, if you talk about the salient human right risk uh, in the supply chains, one of the most significant risks is poverty. You know, extreme poverty is a violence, human right violations uh, in supply chains. And I think these evidence are very clear that you know, we, need to, we need to take action uh, uh, very, very uh, quickly. I've touched upon um, women being hit the hardest uh, with, with the global pandemic, but even pre-pandemic uh, years, women are overrepresented in low-skilled, uh, low-wage jobs, mostly at the base of the largest supply chains. Um, the World Economic Forum uh, have estimated that the global gender gap has actually increased by nearly 40 years, uh, from 99.5, already pre-pandemic, to close the global gender gap to 135.6 years. So it's gonna take nearly an another generation for us to really address some of these issues. You know, women are often being burdened with unpaid care work, particularly during the pandemic and during the lockdown in many of the countries that, that you know, the global North are sourcing from. A lot of them have fallen through the attack of precarious employment. Uh, because you know the wages are cheaper, they are normally on call, uh, very informal type of workers, and this precarious employment has become an emerging risk. Uh, you know during the pandemic and in the post-pandemic world, that I think we need to urgently consider uh, gender-based violence, where women have to be locked down uh, with their violent partners. Uh, um, um, you know dur during during the pandemic. And, and I think, you know, food companies, food retailers, you know, continue to show a lack of evidence in terms of how they are thinking and addressing some of these important uh, and really difficult issues. Um, gender pay gap. Um, this is also based on a survey of about uh, 400, 435 workers in the Thai seafood sector across different tiers. So the overall graph is showing about 28.5 gender pay gap between what the female workers are getting paid and what the male workers are getting paid for doing the same sort of job. Uh, and if you break it down by different tiers, the people who are being more formalized in the, in the factories, um, the gaps is much lower. So it's about 13% in comparison between the male and female um, uh, pay for pre-processing though. So these are the, the women workers who are working in precarious employment. Uh, the gap is very significant. So it's about 40%. So women would be getting 40% less pay than their male counterpart for doing some similar type of jobs. Uh, and in aquaculture, that number have, uh, is about 30%, which is still uh, very significant. And just to conclude, uh, what can be done? The roadmap towards empowering workers in global supply chains, 
So I've, I've showed with you, um, you know, earlier on the, the sort of the circle that show the root causes. Here's another circle when we call this circle of success for companies, right? A holistic approach of managing human rights risks, moving away for, from uh, penitive uh, approaches, which is not sustainable. Uh, we really recommend companies to get ahead of the game, uh, to get ahead of the emerging risk. So starting from adopting a human rights due diligence approach, and I think Dawn and Rachel have already talked about this. You can find more resources uh, in information in the operational guidance, uh, which is really helpful, and that are aligned with the UN guiding principles. But then preventing human rights harm in supply chains are sort of very important. So knowing show risk uh, of your human rights, making sure that workers have platforms and grievance mechanisms to be able to voice their concern if they have been harmed by activities in their, in their supply chains. And finally, achieving positive social impact, um, you know, making sure that workers and farmers are being paid living wages and living income, uh, and again, repeating this, this cycle uh, in, in a very systemic manner. And finally, in more details, and you can read more about these uh, recommendations in our report, but ending violations of rights uh, is, is, is a major responsibility for, for business, starting from knowing and showing the impacts uh, of your activities for your supply chain workers. Uh, again, human rights due diligence, uh, knowing where the women are in your supply chain, having gender disaggregated data, uh, publish an estimate uh, labor share value in high risk chains. So you are knowing that, you know, the, whether the workers and farmers are getting their fair share in terms of their inputs and contribution. Um, secondly, act in your own supply chain. Again, revising, updating your supply chain policies that are aligned uh, with the guidance, with the IRO conventions and national laws, committing to paying living wages, uh, reviewing your buyer incentive policy, and, and, and really importantly, guarantee regular meaningful engagement with trade unions and freedom of association for, for your workers. Uh, I've spoken to one of the workers uh, you know, in, in, during our research, and she said to me, you know, many of the solutions need to, to really be uh, including our voice uh, because, you you know, they wonder how can the solutions be, uh, you know, be, be really appropriately addressing the, solu the problem if that has not really uh, been incorporating the, their voices. And finally, uh, as Madeline said, no one can achieve this alone. So acting beyond your own supply chains, uh, influencing the government, um, democratizing multi-stakeholder initiatives so that frontline organization and workers have a seat at the table um, so that their voices are, are being heard uh, and that we can solve the problem uh, in a holistic way. Thank you very much, Rachel, and I look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you, Art. Um, now I would like to turn to kick off our question and answer uh, period. And Karen, I'd like to ask you to read aloud questions that have come in um, in the Q&A function. Great, thank you, Rachel. And I just wanted to thank all the panelists and you, Rachel, for moderating. It's been, it's been a really good um, set of presentations so far. And we do have quite a few questions that have come in. Want to encourage others if you do have questions to um, type them in the Q and A, and we can read them. Uh, we had in the beginning a few questions on will this um, webinar be shared, and will the resources that were referenced by some of the panelists be shared? So I just wanted to let you know that yes, in the next few days you will receive a recording of this webinar, and in that email that goes to you, we will also include links to the resources that uh, Don, Rachel, and Art um, presented. So in terms of other questions, the first one I have here is, among all salient human rights issues, how do you identify one being more salient than the other? And I thought I turned to Don first to, to provide a response to that, and then others can chime in afterwards. Yeah, hi, thanks for that question. And, and it may be that the questioner already knows quite a lot in a way your, your knowledge is, but I guess what I would first mention is that the fundamental aspect that needs to be looked at amongst all important human rights issues is, is its severity. And that's defined in the UN guiding principles by three aspects called scale, scope, and irremediability, which essentially means how serious is the issue how widespread is it and to what degree can the harm be put right and that defines severity and it's the most severe issues um, that should be at the top of any action plans and the other aspect that can then be brought in is the likelihood so to what degree is this something that 
is a potential risk, but will only happen if a certain series of, of events takes place. Um, and to what degree is this already um, a live issue? So the, the uh, example I like to give is actually related to, to sugarcane that as Madeline presented on, and that is um, addressing the issues that are related to chronic kidney disease of cane workers and other workers who are out in the sun for long hours in the tropics is very much when you look at sugarcane, a very severe and therefore a kind of a priority among the salient issues because you've got something that is threatening the, uh, the, the long-term health and indeed the lives of workers, people who died and are dying. Um, it is widespread because it affects large numbers of workers in multiple sites. Um, it is not remediable once your kidneys have failed uh, and or once you've died. Um, and it's it's known to be happening because there's hard data that says it's happening. So the fact that companies then uh, put money into that, both via their supply chains, but also in collaborative spaces in understanding what implementing rest, uh, water, rest and shade mechanisms needs and trying to drive sectoral change in a country like Mexico is a, is a response to that. And of course, there will be other salient issues in sugarcane, but that ticks all the boxes. So um, I guess that's what I'd say on that. And where you've got lots of, of, of those kind of issues, you need to be thinking about um, kind of where, where you can start and where you will build leverage or, or take follow-up actions. Great, thank you, Dan. Next question. Do you have any research into the cost of adapting a supply chain to incentivize supplier compliance with human rights due diligence practices. For example, brands often pay a premium to in incentivize suppliers to cover increased operational costs associated with addressing forced labor and child labor, et cetera. How does that impact retail price? What percent of the retail cost of sugar goes towards covering costs of comprehensive human rights due diligence in a supply chain? If there is a particular panelist who would like to address that question, please um, unmute yourself. Otherwise, I might ask Madeline to offer a few thoughts since this is a sugar specific question. Thank you. I mean, it's sugar specific, but also very retail specific. Um, so I, I don't know what the what retailers um, are doing specifically in the pricing models. I can just say that it's really up to the companies to really to see how they address the issues. And this can have many different forms like we do with, uh, with projects on the ground to, to co-sponsor development and renovation of shelters or training and so on and so forth. But this really depends on where you do, where you source, what the issues are, what kind of partners they are and really how you set up the collaboration. So it's, there is not one answer that fits the question. Thank you, Madeline. Art, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to think of an example where we have worked with some of the retailers, but I haven't actually come across uh, some of those, you know, um, uh, examples yet. I think I think the uh, you know the, the the challenge at the moment is that you know a lot of retailers are you know continue to focus on you know cost minimizing uh, when when they conduct their, their purchasing and I think a lot of these uh, ex, you know externalities need to be need to be calculated and monetized into you know what is the cost of conducting human rights due diligence in high risk supply chains and and how would that reflect into the costing model uh, for for the retail sector so far I have not seen um, you know. A, a sort of progressive example, but I think that would be the direction of travel that many of the retailers and food companies need to take. Thank you. Don, did you want to add anything there? Thanks, Rachel. I, I merely wanted to say I, I don't know of, of that research, but I would be very interested in seeing it. I think that conversation about how is the cost sharing of the changes that are desired up, upstream being uh, supported along the supply chain. Um, what does that look like in practice? 
Um, what does it mean to support that? And, you know, some of the people I speak with in some of the, the more forward thinking companies are recognizing that that's something that they need to be thinking about really is it's not, it goes, you know, this, this piece about uh, acting within the supply chain, it's not just about cascading requirements and expectations. It's about reflecting on what your own practices um, translate um, like into uh, into support for that um, and support could be yeah capacity building or co-developing something or funding something but I think looking at all of that aspect of what needs to change is where some of the more uh, impact focused companies are are going now whether that's on living wage or living income or on some of these uh, health and safety aspects. Thank you. Karen, do we have other questions in the Q&A? Yes, we do. Uh, next one is, is there an index that can be developed for a company to track their human rights initiatives? I would first direct that question to Dawn, if you know of, a, of an index. Yeah, I don't know whether the person who, who asked it wants to unmute and, and ask, because I'm quite sure what you might have in mind by an index. but. I, I think um, what's important is that as a, as a company, whether you are, um, yeah, like a, a, um, a processing mill for some commodities or whether you're a big brand, um, is that you're clear what, it, what impacts you're trying to address on the ground and how you think your action will, um, will deliver that. And that you have mechanisms, um, your sort of your own KPIs that are monitoring both the processes that you're trying to influence. Um, so, you know, have you managed to get your suppliers to have their policy commitments on human rights and, and due diligence that, that we heard some examples on? Are they putting in place effective grievance mechanisms? But that you're also um, looking at how to track um, and how to kind of capture uh, the impact on those people. And Art talked about, you know, hearing the voices of workers and so on. So it depends where your, your scale is. And there's some interesting work, work being done um, by organizations such as Shift in the, in the kind of human rights space on what, um, what impact uh, indicators might look like. So I think each company needs to have its own sense of what it's trying to do and how it measures whether that's um, helping. But there's lots of collaborative spaces, whether they're um, commodity specific or topic specific, where you'll find allies looking for how do we do that effectively. Um, so I don't think anyone needs to do it on their own. Can I come in quickly, Rachel? Um, yeah, I totally agree with what Donna said. Um, I think, you know, one can also look at existing resources um, on in terms of the assessment of the scorecard that civil society organizations have already done and published. So not just Oxfam scorecard, but know the change um, corporate human rights benchmark uh, also have conducted really much looking at what the global benchmarks is asking companies to do the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the IRO conventions, the OECD guidance on multinational supply chains. And then that's kind of give you a good feedback initial indications of where you are currently in terms of the policy and practice. And I think, you know, that would also be helpful in terms of zooming into the, you know, the issues and the selling, you know, issues that you wanted to focus on. And then that will help you to set your strategy, your vision, uh, your action plan. But again, um, I think the uh, very important ingredient is the consultation with rights holder and, 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 and organizations that are working on the ground, because I think that would give you some very rich feedback uh, in terms of whether those therein uh, issues are in fact uh, very, very uniquely uh, to, to, your, to your supply chain. Thank you. And well, while we have you here, Art, um, there was a question addressed to you of uh, related, how did Oxfam come up with, with the scorecard that you used? Was there a survey to consumers or workers? Uh, so we base it on uh, a number of um, authoritative uh, documents like 
as I've mentioned before, the global benchmark um, across uh, the various topics that we have, but we also consulted and that's how we've sort of developed uh, the 93 indicators across the four categories, uh, for, you know, ranging from lower bar to higher bar. So the lower bar would be the policy commitments, but the higher bar would be looking for evidence of implementation and practice, uh, you know, amongst those, those key indicators. But before we send out to those, you know, companies or, or starting the, 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 the assessments, uh, we consulted with, uh, uh, worker rights organization, women rights organization, trade unions, uh, and allies uh, to make sure that you know those issues are also very important from their perspective. And companies themselves, so all of the 16 companies have an opportunity to provide feedback uh, on those indicators as Oxfam is going to be assessing them on. So it was a very consultative process uh, between all the different stakeholders. And you can you can also download the methodology and all the raw data on our website if you would like to learn more about um, the scorecard. Great, thank you. There's a question here to Madeline about um, uh, PPE for workers, and I believe that she is typing it directly as an answer. So I'll skip it uh, just in the interest of time, and I'll go to a, another question, which is. Um, how do you assess the importance of social audits, BSCI, for example, and what role should they play in human rights due diligence? Or from the other side, are they representing a better picture of companies than is actual reality? Um, they're being performed annually, sometimes announced, et cetera. Probably all of the panelists have some perspective on that issue. Um, why don't we start with you, Don, and then give the others to a chance to weigh in as well. Thanks. You may also have something to say about this, Rachel, as an organization that, that also uh, is very active in, in certification spaces. I think, um, let me see who, um, who uh, I was going to say who wrote this. I've lost, I've lost it, but I think it's a very live, it's a very live issue. It's a really important one. Um, I think, uh, we were just discussing it today internally um, to give you a sense of how how live it is um, it, where I work. And I think there's we have valued and we work very closely with a lot of voluntary standard schemes, um, certification schemes, and round tables that no doubt have shifted the landscape and and really moved forward the topic of sustainability for some commodities and some sectors and I think they will continue to play a really strong role. Some of them have already started to look at how to embed um, expectations for the operations that are certified to have human rights due diligence and many of them already have very strong standards that in a way respond to the risks that they know exist in that in that commodity or in that you know in that kind of farm context or or in that plantation. So they're often very strong in their language on um, some of the internationally recognized workers' rights, for example, and um, land rights and so on. But there's no doubting that they have come under scrutiny and in some cases sort of public criticism for whether or not they can deliver in terms of assurance on the ground, because some of the issues that we need looking at are very difficult to uncover, even in an unannounced audit, um, and such as those things like forced labor that are very difficult to, um, that are deliberately being hidden by almost everyone involved. So I, I don't have an easy answer for you, but I think they, they need to continue to play a role. Um, but we definitely, there's some really interesting initiatives that lots of um, people are involved in and how to strengthen the way that they might be better at detecting some of the human rights issues. Um, and organizations like ISEAL, cross-cutting platform for many of them, um, is doing some really interesting work there as well. Sorry, there are a few other questions that we will not have time to answer. I will attempt to provide answers for those is part of the email that goes out to you with the, with the webinar recording. Um, wanted to, we're pretty much out of time, so I just wanted to give a huge thank you to all the panelists um, for this wonderful conversation, uh, to the questions that came in, and just to wrap things up in terms of moving back to the to the accountability framework, 
um, how to get started using the framework, uh, please feel free to reach out to us, contact one of our AFI coalition members with expertise in workers' rights. Um, Rachel had mentioned before, we've got ProForest, we've got Rainforest Alliance, Verite and SAI are within the AFI coalition, um, all kind of standing by to help support companies and others in applying the framework. Uh, we also have a variety of tools and resources on our website. Um, as was mentioned, recently launched operational guidance on workers' rights. We also have a whole company training and learning webinar series, which this is one of that series. Uh, we have the recordings of all of them uh, available on the website and they cover all of the various uh, aspects and issues um, that are within the framework elements. We also have a self-assessment tool if you would like to benchmark your own um, policies and commitments against the framework and then all sorts of different how-to guides that you can see here. And then we have a newsletter. You can sign up for updates to learn more about the framework. And uh, if you go to the next slide, just to put a little plug in here for the rest of our webinar series. Today was focused on workers' rights. We have three more or two more coming up, one aligning action on deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions, and then applying the framework for deforestation free finance. And if you sign up to our um, newsletter and also check up our, on our website, you will be alerted to when we have dates for these as well as additional webinars. So with that, um, I'll say thank you again to everyone and um, have a great rest of your days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.